What's on go? What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder alongside Ryan Sullivan on uh, what has been uh, quite a couple few days here for Bills fans, probably everywhere, as uh, Bills unexpectedly, to say the least, lose to the Urban Meyer led Jacksonville Jaguars. Still kind of pains me to say that because uh, as a Penn Stater, there's not a lot of people I hate quite more than Urban Meyer. So uh, he's beat me in the collegiate level. Now he's beat me at the professional level. So I don't, I don't really know how I'm supposed to feel about that, Ryan. That's what that's what hurts. Where if it, if we lost to like just oh they got a fun young head coach, whatever. No, we lost to fucking Urban Meyer, and that's so I'm looking forward to talking about this. And then I'm literally never going to talk about this game again. I'm not going. If you tweet at me about this game, if you comment at me about public about this game, I will not acknowledge this from existence. I am black men, men black men. Oh my god, cut that. Men in black in this out of my brain immediately after this podcast yeah i kind of like had that feeling this morning like woke up because like i was you know chatting a little bit here and there with people some on twitter some in person and this morning i just decided said after this podcast after we record tonight i'm like i'm not talking about this game ever again moving forward just out of the system because it's very easy to get very like amped up i've realized talking about this game because it was just such a, frankly, for lack of a better word, it was, just, it was an awful game. I mean, the only other time in my life that I compare, just from a entertainment perspective, a Bills game to that low of a level was when I was a nine year old at the Browns Bills game in like 09 when it was six to three. I mean, that is like literally the last time I can remember just sitting through just such a miserable game, it- just in general. And then you add in the fact that, well, one team's led by Urban Meyer and has one win, and then one team being the Bills is a Super Bowl contender going into this season with an MVP contender at quarterback. It just really was just such a rough game to watch as a fan. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's really nothing else to say. I mean, we're going to talk a whole lot about it here, so I shouldn't say that. But it just, context considered where this team is, it just, it sucked. It, there was, there's nothing outside of the defense that you can really take out of this game. So a, as we start here i think we have to kind of break down where this blame goes in this game and i think obviously the place you have to start is that offensive line it's the easiest target but it's the easiest target for a reason and you know i i think offensive line sometimes is a scapegoat for other things not going well but of the just just some some such as the, the numbers the numbers let's give numerical value to how bad this offensive line was the Jacksonville only brought five, brought more than four, five times in this game. They got 17 pressures. All four sacks were when they brought four guys. The most damning number of this game, Taven Bryant. Do you know how many sacks in 55 games Taven Bryant had coming into this game, Mitch? I looked it up before we recorded, so I do know, but uh, I'll just say for fans, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's less than five. He had three. He played 55 games and he had three sacks and he had two and a half in this game. That is insane. Tevin Bryant. Jacksonville doesn't like Tevin Bryant. Tevin Bryant doesn't like Tevin Bryant and he got two sacks in this game. That is unreal. Just comical levels of implodement on that offensive line. So I think if we're going to start somewhere, sorry if I blew out anyone's eardrums with that, but that's where you got to start. Offensive line, it was bad as, as the eye test. Uh, told you in that game absolutely that's where i think it starts and ends i think the people who are out here criticizing dable criticizing allen not to say that they're clear criticism i think you have to step back when your offensive line does not allow you to execute a, any play of any kind run pass del- you know it doesn't matter what it is five step drop back shotgun you know anything it is impossible to do anything i mean we we saw back in 2018 when the Bills' offensive line was atrocious, right? They couldn't do shit offensively for that entire season because of that. I, I have a bunch of friends who are Giants fans, so I've witnessed what a disastrous O-line can do to an offense regardless of what the talent is that they have at, at the skill position players. So the offensive line was, was atrocious. And I think what's really disheartening in particular, Ryan, about this is that this game, I think, truly exposed how poor the depth on this offensive line is more than anything because they have two starters out and don't get me wrong. That's not good for any team. You don't want to lose your starters, but 
It took two starters going down, and this offensive line was incompetent, like completely incapable of doing simple, basic NFL-type things on the offensive line. And that's what, as a fan, and, and when I was watching this game, it was just getting at me so much is that injuries happen, and the fact that this is how bad the depth is is such a problem. Yeah, and, you know, just... I want to apologize. I, I got into a fight with a lot of you on Twitter this offseason about defending Cody Ford and saying, hey, maybe let's give him some time. He had two injury-plagued years. Let's give him some time. And no, Cody Ford is terrible. So if I yelled on you on Twitter about Cody Ford, I apologize. I was loud wrong about Cody Ford. I think I did that last week too, but I can't think of an offensive lineman in and probably prisoner of the moment here, but I can't think of out having Vlad Dukas on this line, having Marshall Newhouse on this line, having Russell Bodine on this line. I can't think of a lineman that got beat worse than Cody Ford got beat in this game. And I think there's a lot of people, and there's a lot of things that make this a lot less paddable too. Part of it is, I, I put this out right after the game, I think it's hard to look at Creed Humphrey. I said this last week too, I think looking at Creed Humphreys, who's getting mid season, all pro accolades. while Boogie Basham is on the bench and in street clothes. And that is a, it it's Boogie Basham would still be a great player, but it's really a rough look after a game like this to have a second, to have a, a, a draft pick on the sideline like that. And have and, and have Creed Humphreys doing what he's doing. It's a bad look. It's rough. It is really, really rough. But the, before we talk about any other coaches, you know, I, I want to credit Judge and the Air Raid Hour guys with this take first. I saw them take their take on this, and, and I've kind of ran with it since then. But Bobby Johnson is the guy I think we want to go pitchforks on a coach. Bobby Johnson, the offensive line coach, has to be it. For three years, he three years ago, they had an okay enough offensive line. Feliciano held his own. A lot of these guys did okay. And ever since then, this offensive line has gotten worse. Feliciano has gotten worse. Cody Ford has not developed. Whatever he was doing with Wyatt Teller, granted he was a rookie, didn't work, and he became an all-pro after this. So at some point, it's got to go beyond Dable. It's got to go beyond. It's got to look at the guy who is working most closely with these players that is working to develop protections because some of the stuff in that game, I'm sure this one of the things that I saw scrolling past scrolling past my Twitter was a, was a screenshot from Robert Mays that showed three guys blocking one blocking one guy. And then Smoot coming in the free rusher inexcusable at some point. We'll talk more about Dable McDermott in a second, but if we're calling for the firing of a coach, start with Bobby Johnson because he's had three years to get this right and he's just gotten worse. How about another thing that Bobby Johnson has 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 screwed up here too is what the hell happened to Darrell Williams? I mean, this was a guy who a year ago was a steady right tackle for this team and he cannot play right tackle anymore. I mean, he was getting burned all game. I mean, he even at that one play, Ryan, where he was still in a stance after the ball was snapped the full second. Bobby Johnson, I think, and, I, that, and, and as someone who I remember when the Bills first added him to this coaching staff, and during that 2019 season when the offensive line made pretty big improvements in the year before, I was someone who stand Bobby Johnson big time. I was a huge fan of his. I thought that he was a great hire, and I'm eating those words big time right now because, like you said, this offensive line hasn't developed. They don't seem to ever have a play, never have had a plan for a lot of these guys, and it's come back to bite them. And the thing that's really, I think, what makes it worse, too, is that these are all guys who have been in this system, in on, on, on this team, working with Bobby Johnson for two, three, four seasons, and this is what it's looked like after that time. I mean, to me, that I agree with you. It's completely inexcusable that you have these veteran guys who've been with you for years to look that out of place. It, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you know Judge and Tilt. The, uh, you know, Bobby Johnson's absolutely, I think, the first guy, as far as the coaching staff's concerned, that needs to answer some questions because the offensive line's a problem. I mean, it's the weakest link on this team. It's uh, At this point, I don't think it's really close. And now I could probably spend all lines wearing up the O-line, but 
looking at other people to blame for this, and I, and I'm putting him be I'm putting this player before Dable and before McDermott for a reason. And I want to preface it with this: you can Clay caught a lot of smoke on Twitter for this yesterday, and I give I give him a lot of credit. You can criticize a player for a game without it being an indictment on him as a whole season. Josh Allen has been having a good year. He is a top 10 quarterback playing good football overall. He did not do the things you need to do when he actively made it harder for this team to win yesterday or Sunday. You, there was multiple times where he could have eaten the ball. Let's look at, look at the first interception. They are in field goal range. You know, it, it sucks that we're, we're breaking it down the field goals, but whatever that third down, he had a clean pocket and he chose to force the ball to Cole Beasley. You can't have that. That was a objectively bad decision. You eat it, you run it and you take your field goal and you go home and you go back to the sideline. That's three points right there that at least ties the game. The, the, th- the, the pick on jo- the, the pick to Josh Allen. God, I'm so tired of that damn story to pick the Josh the other Josh Allen that that was 2019 that was 2018 Josh stuff you cannot you got to eat your sack sometimes and I'm sorry Otto if you're listening to this but sometimes you you have to accept the I forgot who I heard say this but three outcomes whatever outcome comes off a drive it needs to be a kick uh extra point a punt or a field goal and sometimes when everything blows up, like that play where he just yeeted it up and it got picked off, sometimes you just got to say, damn it, take your sack and, and live the play another day. And he didn't do that. That was a massive brain spark, fart that gave them points that put them on plus field position to kick a field goal. Or did they not get a field goal off? Did they get a field goal off that one? I forgot if they... That actually might have been when their kicker missed three kicks in a row. It might have been that series. But still, though easily could have been points nonetheless exactly so no one no one who criticizes josh allen like myself like clay from this game is saying josh allen's bad but the decisions josh allen made yesterday or i keep saying yesterday on monday recording this on tuesday were problematic and you can't have that stuff going forward and not even just you know taking you know throwing up these bad interceptions also, from what the you know film people have been posting on social media, which again I, I don't claim to know what I'm looking at when it comes to film, but I just try to kind of echo what they say. Josh Allen missed checkdowns the whole game. I mean, he was really trying to force the ball down the field, and I understand that as a quarterback, sometimes you know that's not, that's obviously your last read is the checkdown. But there was one play in particular. I know everyone's circling where. Singletary is just wide open with probably at least 10 yards of grass in front of him to make guys miss, make a play. And Josh Allen just never even looks his way and is just trying to push the ball down the field. And listen, Josh Allen's a gunslinger and he wants the big play. And I listen, I'd rather my quarterback want to make big plays happen than be, as they say, kind of check down Charlie. But sometimes you just have to just take what the defense gives you. And Josh Allen has gotten much better at that over his career. No question about it. But yesterday, he definitely, or not yesterday, on Sunday, he definitely missed a lot of opportunities for easy completions that could have got them into second and third and shorts, maybe even moved the chains. And instead, he was trying to get all back at once just too many times. And again, I don't think he's the number one person or group I'm putting blame on. I think we could both agree the offensive line cost them the most. But Josh Allen's decision making on Sunday didn't help either. And I think what was most telling. In an, in, in an organization that does a really good job of not throwing stones and after press conferences like this, you see it a lot where stuff goes wrong and sometimes, you know, not even intentionally, but guys will let a snide comment fly. It doesn't happen that often with this organization. You go back the uh, Kirk Cousins had a moment like that in the, in the Miami press, Miami, Minnesota press conference. I'm all over the place today. Minnesota press conference last week where he, he, through uh Mike Zimmer under the bus. You know, they do a really good job of not doing that, owning that. But in Brian Dable's press conference today, they asked him about the third and two press the third and two uh zone read that he in no way should have kept to himself and got that fumble. And he, you know, he didn't say anything really negatively about it, but I think 
his comment, which was that I'm going to keep that between me and him, I think was very telling about his attitude on, or his belief of what should have happened with that play. Now we can argue whether that was the right play call there or not given the state of the offensive line, but just, just too many bad decisions that made it really hard to win this game in a game where the offense wasn't doing a ton anyways. So with that, I, I think now I think what people are really harping on is the coaching in this game. And, and, I've been told that I carry too much water for Brian Dable and that I'm a Brian Dable apologist. And I want to start here and not harp too much on the offensive line. There is nothing you can do. There is no game plan for four people beating your offensive line. There isn't. There is no answer for, there is no game plan heat around your offensive line getting its ass kicked. And if I'm going down the line, if I'm if I'm the Bruce exclusive, the Bruce Dolan plurality ply of giving out blame, I think this was one of Sean McDermott's weaker games. And there's two calls that stick out in my mind particularly strong. And I wonder if you picked up on these two. The first one was, I think it was the first half, that wild play where Josh got whacked in the face, no flag, and then rolls out and did his little flip thing, gets it to Sanders, who... Yep look like to me completed the process of the catch and instead of challenging it just takes a time out which to me was insanely nonsensical uh, you are let's say challenge it you're getting you're going to get time on the sideline to chill out anyways and if you don't get it you're just out of timeout anyway so i don't i don't understand the thought process on that call even if you didn't think you were going to win it which i think they might have it looked like he completed the process of that catch even again what's a catch and he and he just he took a timeout i just thought that was in, absolutely inexcusable and silly and then the one that to his credit he admitted to to uh getting to getting wrong that he admitted was the wrong call was even though that false start on Ike Bakker at, on fourth and two in the fourth quarter with 10 minutes left was probably the wrong call. Not going forward on fourth and seven. I don't care how good your defense is playing. Punting there is cowardly, cowardly, cowardly punting. And if you follow, I think it's puntalytics or oh, surrender index. It was in the 97th percentile of, of most uh, uh, cowardly punts. I don't, I don't think they call it cowardly, but co- uh, of, of, of bad punts. So there were some calls where I think McDermott also made it harder for this team to win again, not an indictment on him as a coach, but just, he didn't have a great game either. And on top of that too, I mean, at the end of the day, the bills had what 12 penalties this game for over a hundred penalty yards. And that does reflect coaching a little bit. And no question. I agree with you. This was definitely, I think McDermott's weakest game that I can remember from him with the decision-making and just how the team just performed. I mean, they just were, they were flat on offense. They were very unenergized. And at the end of the day, that goes back to coaching. Um, but going back to your, the, you know, the decisions that you brought up that McDermott definitely botched. I agree with you. I did. I literally said out loud when I was watching that standard replay, that looks like a catch. They should challenge that. And they just did it. And, and the thing that's so weird to me too, is, you know, the bills have guys who are in the booth who are paid to basically just go tell McDermott, you should throw a flag here. Did they not say anything to me? That seemed like a clear, at least throw the challenge because just to have them take a look at it. And then I agree with you that punt on fourth and seven was just at that point in the game, you got it. You got to just go for it when your offense is so dead and they were finally moving the ball just a little bit, especially with the way the defense was playing. The Jaguars were not a threat offensively really at any point in this game. You needed a touchdown right there because I, I, a touchdown was going to win you this game, plain and simple and, and a punt to give the ball back and, and effectively put your offense back on the field, backed up because the Jaguars punter, give him credit. He played a hell of a game and kept on flipping the field on Buffalo, but McDermott didn't bring it for sure. I think that's another guy to blame. And then a, a guy that I blame a little bit, Ryan, I'm curious if you agree with this. I'll, I'll explain myself. And I'm curious what you have to say. I, I tweeted this after the game. I said, I think Brandon Bean deserves a little bit of blame for how this game played out because he has... Listen, I love Brandon Bean. I'm a huge fan of his. I think he's one of the better GMs in football, and he's been a huge reason to why this rebuild has turned out the way it has. But he has really screwed up this offensive line over the last three, four years. Obviously, we saw what happened with Wyatt Teller. You know, what are you going to do about that? But Quentin Spain has turned into a good starter for Cincinnati. 
They kept Brian Winters last year for so long. During the offseason, we knew this interior offensive line was shaky and that maybe drafting a guy wouldn't be bad, but instead, he doubled down on DN and took Boogie Basham while Creed Humphrey's an all-pro. He doubled down on tackle, and when Tommy Doyle stands on the sideline every game, never sees the field, Trey Smith's been a very solid, good starter for KC. And then on top of that, the trade deadline, where there were some guys available when you're in a championship window, and I know it's about you know sustaining success, but... You had a chance to win a Super Bowl with the AFC as weak it is, as it is and it just never do anything different. Just to not make a move and just stand by Cody Ford, who's been a bust, and, and Ike Bucker, who at best is average. I, I, I think that I'm not saying this is all his fault at all because it does ultimately go back to the players not executing and Bobby Johnson not getting these guys ready to play. But I think that Brandon Bean hasn't made this any easier on the coaching staff because he has never he hasn't upgraded his offensive line really at all in the last two years it it does seem like excuse me this does seem like that he drank a little bit too much of the process juice and that he bought a little bit too much into his own players you know when we had bruce on in the summer he talked about you don't re-sign meh players and that's what john feliciano was a meh player for this team Mike bakker he was cheap but they just weren't answers and i think they bought too much in to the culture. And once again, I mean, I'll get into this a little bit, but this is still a five and three team. This is still a team in first place. And this is still a team that this is a mess of a division right now. But after a game like that, and when you see the context of what other rookies are doing, it is really tough to see guys that we have just not be ready. And, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's telling that, why can't we bring Tommy Doyle in and then push Williams back inside where he was starting to figure it out? Uh, why Ryan Bates has been on this roster for three years. What he's supposed to be this versatile guy and he can't buy time on the field. Why can't he play guard? I, it, there's a lot of guy. It, it just seems like offensive line is a, that can offensive lines can go south so quickly with injuries. And it just seems like they weren't ready for that. But, when we look at how this can get better, because we just did, and it was kind of cathartic to go through and just kind of shit on everything that went wrong in this game. I think there are things that are really fixable on this roster. First of all, this offensive line was bad, but I think it is important to remember, like you said, two injuries isn't nothing. Like two injuries, even though John Feliciano isn't great, matter. Spencer Brown was figuring it out. Daryl Williams was figuring out they were playing passable football. Granted, they didn't play a ton of deep talent, but they were figuring it out and they were, they were becoming a passable offensive line that can win you games with Spencer Brown at right tackle and Daryl Williams at right guard. And when you, when you get into the game of shifting guys around again, that hurts. That is never great. So I, Spencer Brown, according is according to McDermott today or yesterday, whenever he had his press conference, said he's going to practice this week. That is big. I think whoever's at that other guard spot, I don't. I, it doesn't really matter. I don't think. But as long as it's not Cody Ford, as long as it's not Cody Ford, you know, I, I think that'll help. I don't think the offensive line is going to be this bad all year. Knock on wood. We didn't think we were going to have another game like you know we said we said after Pittsburgh that oh that well not every line can do that. Well, apparently Tavon Bryant can do that. But I, I think. Once this line gets back to full strength, and it, it seems like Spencer Brown is coming back, I think that will be fine. And you know, we saw, we, we see, look at what Tennessee is doing now with Harold Landry and and uh, Isaiah Simmons, not Isaiah Simmons, who's their big Jeffrey Simmons, and they're causing problems. And the Bills wasn't pretty, but they held their own against that defensive front in that game. So they're figuring this out. So. I think that's a big part of it. Is, is there anything else that you think this team needs to do to kind of get its ducks in a row here going forward? Well, I mean, the only two things I can think of is just like you said, with Spencer Brown getting healthy, another guy that needs to get healthy so badly for this team. And it's funny because if you said this back in, you know, April, I think people would have laughed at you, but geez, man, they need Dawson Knox back so badly because Part of that checkdown game is Dawson Ox making plays with the ball in his hand after the catch. They don't they don't have that ability with with Tommy Sweeney. Tommy Sweeney's not a bad backup tight end. He's a good blocker. He catches the ball. But listen, Tommy Sweeney's catch the ball and then go down. That's that's what he does. And they don't or fumble. 
or fumble, right? They, they, they don't have a playmaker right there. And the only other thing I can think of, and I'm not saying that this fixes um, any issues in the running game when it comes to as far as the offensive line is concerned, but with Zach Moss in concussion protocol, I assume he's probably not going to play this week. I do want them to see if they can use Brita. And the Brita season, baby. I mean, just see if the, some speed can help him. Just because, listen, I know that Brita's not the most nuanced running back in the league, but this is a guy who's got legit track speed, and maybe they could use that somehow. I don't know how, but those are the only two things that I could think of aside from just simply get Spencer Brown back on the field because, honestly, it's become apparent that Spencer Brown has become one of the most valuable pieces to this offense at this point because we've seen now what it's like when he goes down and it's not pretty so they need him to be healthy the whole rest of the way through because he's all of a sudden become an incredibly important person on this offense and one that the 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 success of this offense really hinges on i'm just saying there's a certain wide receiver who who came to uh apart from who who just got cut from a team who is also a troubled receiver Thus, must like Stefan Diggs, who is also uber talented, like Stefan Diggs, who wants to go a contender. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I know it's a hot, fun topic. I'm just going to throw it out there. But in all seriousness, in all seriousness, you know, I, I think I caught in the big count, caught a lot of heat this week for kind of being apologists for this game. And, and I want to strike the tone that this was not okay. This was not acceptable. And there were things in this that are deeply concerning going forward. But I think. There's a couple reasons why we're talking about our level of concern with this team. And I am, it sucked. This game sucked. And I'm still not as concerned as a lot of other people. I'm, I'm at probably a six at this point. But look at the context of the league right now. Look at what happened this week. Cowboys get their absolute ha- ass handed to them by the Denver Broncos. You have Kansas City, who still doesn't look like themselves. Sure, sure, you have Tennessee have a out of nowhere game against the Rams, who looked like world beaters, but they have concerns with how sustainable is that offense, right? There's this league right now is a mess. There is no true best team. I guess you can say Arizona because they just smacked around the 49ers with Colt McCoy, but this team is a mess. And, it sounds like a cop out, but guys, football happens sometimes. This is a weird sport. And every once in a while, you're going to have things like this happen. And what separates good teams and great teams from med teams, not playoff teams, is being able to bounce back from this stuff and being able, and this coaching staff, regardless, they've had some stinkers. They've had games that haven't, <laughs> that have been really, really ugly. And it's the ability to bounce back and, 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 show i'm trying to think of a cliche i can't but just bounce back from this and that's why a lot of my defense this week was listen relax it was bad it's concerning but until it becomes a trend until they do this again um hopefully they don't do that but if this happens again and we see the same issues or they win like a three game game against the jets okay let's come back and talk about the serious long-term potential of this team going into the playoffs but until then this is a first place football team this is a this is a division a conference where everybody has an ugly loss everybody has an ugly loss tennessee everyone's tennessee is so good they lost to the jets we have the Bengals that are plummeting the the patriots have a noodled arm quarterback it this this division this league is a mess right now so if there's any year to kind of be a mess of a team and not and and not really know what's going on. This is the year. This is the year to do it. And and let me also remind people too, because I think this this even goes into good context when it comes to the Jaguars game. The Ravens were a a bank in sixty six yard field goal being made. Right, that's what it took them to be and a the missed delay game. And they missed a delay game and before that game and a fourth and twenty conversion against the currently winless Detroit Lions. Still like. I, I agree with you, Ryan. Listen, is my level of concern a little higher after this week than how it was, say, after the Titans game? 100%. There's no question that I think some things got exposed on this football team. But there's outside of Arizona, there's no dominant team right now in the NFL. It's quite apparent. It's it's quite apparent. And I, I will not hit the panic button. I'm not going to break the glass yet. 
unless, like you said, they they come out and play like shit against the Jets or they lose to the Jets even. Unless something like that happens, I think that, yes, you can be a little bit more concerned about this team moving forward because they have issues that aren't going to probably be solved this season and they're going to just have to learn to play with. But they still have nine more games left this season. There's There's a lot that can happen. Yep. And so let's... We had the still just game talk about what half an hour in it. So let's let's go through our gold star player, our LVP, and then we're also gonna do we're halfway through well, this is what game eight, right? So yep, we're kind of we're base we're basically halfway. We're gonna call this halfway because uh because whatever, it's 17 weeks. I choose not to acknowledge that. So we're gonna call this midseason. So gold star player of the game. For me, it was real simple. I just gave it to the entire defense. I, I can't imagine being a defense, giving up nine points and no touchdowns. No touchdowns for the third time this year, by the way, and not winning a football game against the Jags. That's got to be incredibly frustrating. This game, this defense, a loss in all this was just how absolutely phenomenal this defense is. Just, And, and it sucks that that was lost because even if they had won, like, I don't know, 20-9, to nine, at least people would have been talking about that. And I think so much of that is lost in this game. I just another game where everyone played well. Who's your who's your gold star player? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to to Tyler Bass, who has I mean, just never seems to miss. The dude's automatic and I mean, listen, they didn't have that good of a kicker on their team. Maybe this is even a worse loss. I know it sounds kind of weird to say that, but dude's been automatic for them. He scored all their points and also, for what it's worth, Jamal Agnew, who is an incredibly dangerous returner the Jaguars have, never even had a chance to return a ball because Bass was smashing him out of the end zone. So I'll give it to Tyler Bass for my gold star. Who's your LVP, though? Who who sticks out of you? I mean, there's a, there's a lot to pick from, I think, in this game. I think we're both going to pick the same general area here, but who who are you picking for your LVP? I'm on a tear. It's Bobby Johnson. I I understand these players aren't great, but you got to figure something out and, and it falls on you. It falls on Bobby Johnson. So I, I'm going for the coach and and it, for me, it's 100% Bobby Johnson slash offensive line, but he's the one who gets them ready. So I'm going Bobby Johnson. And I'm going to go specifically with Cody Ford. Um, just because I think he was the worst of the worst. Uh, they all were bad on the old line, but he was just a disaster and uh, just, Simply put, not only is Cody Ford not a starter of the NFL, I don't think Cody Ford's an NFL caliber offensive lineman, period. Um, he, to me, is now in the same sort of category that we are all memeing Bobby Hart to be in. Because that's that's what it feels like at this point. So uh, I think that I, I, I think that Cody Ford, for me, is the guy that I'm putting as my LVP. How about we get into midseason awards, though? Because, like you said, we're about halfway through. Who's your midseason MVP? Because I think there's a lot of guys you could pick for this, Ryan. But I'm curious as to who you have. I'm going with the most important player, the guy who's won us games. And I'm going Josh Allen. It, I, I know I don't even know who that was that put out that bait tweet that Josh Allen took a massive step back. Look at his numbers. A lot of people have also put out the numbers, and his numbers are pretty similar to last year. And there's been a little bit more inefficiencies. But Josh Allen showed that he's back-to-back. He's a top-10 quarterback. You're not always going to be QB1 or QB2. He is still playing really good football. He is still, he is still this offense. He is still. There is no other player I want on this team than Josh Allen. Then I don't want the ball in anyone's hands besides Josh Allen. And, and when it comes, when push comes to shove. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. I mean, I jokingly wrote down Spencer Brown. I mean, I don't literally mean that. I, I, I'm going to agree with you. I think that it is Josh Allen because we know that Josh Allen can simply make something into nothing. And here's the craziest thing. I didn't even know this, Ryan, after the game, that Josh Allen has been pressured the second most out of any starting quarterback in the National Football League. And frankly, if you're watching Bill's games, you would never even guess that. I mean, you'd assume it'd be kind of high, but second most in the National Football League, and he's not even anywhere near the high, the most sacked quarterback, is remarkable that he's able to essentially bail out this offensive line time and time again and make throws, even in this game, which admittedly was a bad game for him. He still made a couple plays that, you know, you watch and go like, woof, like that. What a man, what a Manuel Sanders throw was wild. What a throw. What he's fading away. I mean, come on. Wild. Come on. I mean, so I agree with you. Josh Allen, for me, is still 1,000% uh, MVP uh, for me. So for LVP, though, 
for the midseason awards, for me, I have to go with uh, specifically the interior offensive line. Um, I mean, they have been bad. And I'm excluding Mitch Morris because Mitch Morris, I don't know why everyone said get rid of Mitch Morris. He's proven to be the most consistent offensive lineman on this team, hands down. So I don't want to hear it that the Bills should have cut Mitch Morris because he's he's been too good for them. But the guards have just been terrible the whole season. And it's concerning when your best guard at this point in time is the guy that started 16 games for you at right tackle a season ago. I mean, that's what the state of it is. And, you know, that to me, they're just clearly the weakest link on this football team. How about you, though? I also had, I literally had interior offensive line. I don't, we've talked plenty about it, so I won't, I won't harp on the point any longer, but it, it's just, it's hampered everything this team tries. Not everything, but it, it, it's been the limiting factor on this team. And if they don't win a Super Bowl, that's what we're going to be talking about all, all off season it is the interior offensive line. And you know what? Oh, and, and most improved player. So I'll go, I'll start with mine on this one. Most improved player and a guy that, is I, don't, I call him a Rorschach test because even now people you can look at him and see nine different things but I think Tremaine Edmonds for a guy that has been so controversial and such a topic of debate has really stepped up in this game this year and I know coming off the Jags game people are going to look like oh look at that Jamal Agnew throw He's, you shouldn't be running with Jamal Agnew Jamal Agnew's like a 4-2 guy he shouldn't have been out on that play um but he, he, I think he's played really good football this year and really been an important cog in that defense. And it, I don't, I think there's a certain sect of people that, no matter how good he plays, are going to be happy with him. But I, I've been incredibly pleased with the football he's playing this year. I like that, and I and I think that we can finally say that Tremaine Edmonds has really grown into like him as a player you know we always said oh he's so young he'll figure out i think you could say to say he's, he's really started to figure it out all the nuances of being the middle linebacker being that you know quarterback of the defense so i like that pick i'm gonna go in a different direction though and i'm gonna give it to a guy who all of a sudden has become a very important player for them on that offense that's dawson knox i mean dawson knox is somebody now that is crucial to this offense and their success because what he does the mismatches he 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 presents to a defense, I mean, people are saying how the Jaguars were playing a lot of too high the whole game, right? Similar to what we did to Kansas City. Well, guess what? You know who forces defense to not do that? It's Dawson Knox. So him being on the field changes how defenses play us. And the fact that we're saying that after last year where we were all convinced the Bills you know, needed to go make a move at tight end it, it is really something. So for me, Dawson Knox has been such a improved player for their, off, uh, for their offense, regardless if he's producing or not. He's just presenting issues and 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 changes what defenses do against the Bills offense. So for me, he's my most improved player of the game or uh, of the season so far. The Bills need the 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 line Bills need Dawson Knox back. If you had said it last year, would have been laughed at. So it it it, it is funny to hear that. So it's been cathartic. We got the jet the the Jets game the the Jags game out of the way. The one other note that I had I didn't get to just about midseason stuff is. Let's stop running the football. That's all I want. Let's yep. stop, stop pretending you want to run the football. Ryan, you got to be balanced. Balance teams win Super Bowls. Nah, fuck that. Throw the ball every single time. Throw, make, use a short game as your run game. I'm done running the ball. And like, I'm 80% Mimi, but not really. I want, stop running the football. Yeah. But use the pass to set up the run. <laughs> right. Like I'm, I'm, I'm done running. It, it's, let's live in the space age. No more run. Okay. Right. <laughs> On to the Jets this week in. Another rookie head coach who I think has a very different vibe to him than Urban Meyer. So we are now, this is the about the halfway point of the season now. What have you seen from Robert Sala in New York? What are some things you've liked? Some of the things that you think he's not doing well? What, what have been your overall impressions on Robert Sala and this new Jets regime? You know, I was a really big fan of Robert Sala when he was with San Francisco, so I thought that it was a home run hire for the Jets, and it's been rocky, no question. I mean, he's it's a rebuild going on. That roster has minimal talent, a lot of injuries, so listen, they've gotten blown out badly a bunch of times this season. But overall, you know, Robert Sala, I wouldn't say I've been in, like, you know, like super impressed with him. But I think he's been pretty good. There's no question he's a leader. The players respond to him. They like him. I think he says all the right things. 
Um, I think that they play tough for him. I just think that their talent or their lack of talent just kind of is what does them in more times than not. But overall, I think Robert Sala has got a bright future. It's tough to judge him again with this team because they're just they're they're just he's not working with much there, especially now with you know guys like Marcus May landing on IR. Like those are guys that just can't afford to lose. So overall, though, I like Robert Sala. I think he's been pretty good. Um, so yeah, that's my take on him. How about you? Yeah, I th- think I keep seeing things where it's like Robert Sala is supposed to be this defensive mastermind. And like you said, there, there isn't a lot there on that team. But I think the way you kind of judge teams in this situation is not the record, but just how they play, right? Can they play above themselves? Can they play together? And it's a team that I, when I watch, I see them play together. The Jags, on the other hand, until, of course, yeah, until Sunday, was a team where I didn't see that. It was on a team that I really saw playing together. This is The Jets are a team that I, even though they're not super talented, I see them playing together. I see... I see the path to success in the future. I see good processes in that team. And, you know, when we look at what this team is, they're now, they, we said last week Jags were 32nd in DVOA defense. The Jags went up to 26 after that game in DVOA defense. was kind of funny. The Jets are now last in DVOA, DVOA, DVOA defense, 30th against the pass, 31st against the run. And, as good as as much as I respect Robert Sala and the job he's doing with that team, there's a reason that they have two wins at this point. And they've had the last two games have actually been kind of, I thought, impressive. Obviously, they had the one game that they won against the Bengals, which shocker, and they won a game against the Titans, which was a big shocker. And I think they put up an impressive performance considering most of that game uh, against the Colts. They had Josh Johnson as their quarterback and they were they were Josh Johnson interception away from covering the spread in that game so he's got them playing not good football but together football and and I think got them believing in themselves and I think that's a big part of when you're a bad team but at the end of the day this isn't a overly impressive roster and the offense I think when you look at at least just by name power and name talent alone probably had is the stronger of the unit. So when you look at the offense, what, what are some of the strengths you see on that side of the ball? Their offense doesn't have a lot. Um, I'll, I'll say that. I think it's no question. That's the weaker uh, side of the ball for them. It's, it's tough to say just because honestly the quarterback situation, there is so wacky because Zach Wilson did not look good really at all. He gets hurt. Then the legend of Mike White happens. Then he gets worse, gets hurt. Then Josh Johnson comes in and throws for 300 yards. So I, I don't really know what to expect, frankly, for who's going to be under center with this offense. Um, but I will say, though, they have some nice little players. I mean, Michael Carter's turned into a real nice player for them at, at running back. A guy that I I know a lot of people here at BF really loved in the draft. He's looked good for them. Corey Davis has been a pretty good number one for them. Um, so they do have some guys to throw the ball to. Uh, you know, Elijah Moore starting to become a real weapon in their offense. They still have Jameson Crowder. So there are a couple of good players to this Jets offense that I think can make some plays. Um, overall, though, I don't know if anything really specifically concerns me. Uh, you know, maybe Mike White could do some things on this defense just because he seems to be, you know, have a decent arm, be relatively you know, accurate. Might not, you know, I don't, I don't think he's complete trash by any means. So. Maybe that, but ultimately, I don't think there's really anything as offense that that's scaring me too much. You know, I, I think they got some interesting wide receivers. Jamison Crowder is a legitimately good slot wide receiver. And if Teron Johnson's in this game and we have to rely on Siren, uh, Saran Neal, that could be potentially problematic. Uh, Elijah Moore is a dude with a ton of talent who is slowly, slowly figuring it out on that slowly, slowly figuring out, but this is an offensive line too, with some, with some injuries, you know, Makai Becton, who is phenomenal is on IR right now. Tyler Croft is on IR right now, but you know, there are some places where I do think they match. And and I said it, I think Jamison Crowder could be a mashup issue in this game. If he has to go up against Neil. And I think 
you know, you know we, we talk about it. You, you go back to the Tennessee game. They Levi Wallace did struggle with big physical AJ Brown and Corey Davis is not AJ Brown, but Corey Davis is a dude. He he is physical. He's big. He will attack cornerbacks. He's really good in the in in, in run blocking. So he's someone where you look at places where maybe you can take advantage. It's it's at that backup slot spot. It's at Levi Wallace who struggles with those types of receivers. And one note on Mike White because I think obviously that was the story out of not last week but the week before this, but I forgot the exact number, but in that game, Mike White did not make a pass downfield in the game that he beat Cincinnati. They just, Cincinnati played a really, just they never adjusted to what they were doing. And it wasn't, I mean, to put up 400 yards, throwing the ball like five yards at a time, which is super impressive. And you look at philosophical matchups and the Bills who their whole philosophy is keep everything in front, rally to tackle, short of the sticks. And Mike White, who in his first start did a really good job of taking what was given to him and just matriculating, matriculating, matriculating every drive. So I I think there are some a little bit of advantages there, but I just don't think the talent is enough to exploit that. And you see it with rookie quarterbacks sometimes. They come out, or guys like Mike White, they have their moment in the sun, and then they come back and they get shellacked. And I think if Mike White gets a start in this game, which it looks like everything points to him starting in this game, that he'll come back and I, this will probably be his, his come, come back to earth game because, once again, we, we've seen what McDermott does against quarterbacks like that. Yeah, now moving on kind of like the defense for the Jets because I think this is probably the side of the ball that I would be a little bit more concerned with. And specifically for me, Ryan, when I look at this defense, you know, the Jets actually have a pretty decent defensive front. Their D-line is not a joke. Uh, Quinn and Williams is really blossoming, I think, into a very nice player in their defense. They have Sheldon Rankins, who's a guy that had some really good years in, in New Orleans, who's a good player. Um, John, John Franklin Myers is another guy on the inside for them that can that can be disruptive, that can cause some problems. Um, you know, they have Shaq Lawson, who's a familiar face for Bills fans, who's made a few plays for them. So and Delshawn Phillips. Yeah, and they got Delshawn Phillips. So it's a little bit of a revenge game for a couple of guys, not just Tyler Croft, unfortunately, who's now not going to be playing, but a few guys have a revenge game coming up. But yeah, no, this 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 defensive front is not half bad. You mix in CJ Mosley, who's a who's a very good player and a guy that I think people forgot how good he was just because he's basically not played football for two straight seasons. Um, but this front seven's not a joke. They can make some plays. Yeah, I mean, we 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 just spent all, all we just spent all day talking about how bad the interior offensive line was against the Jacksonville Jaguars and Quinn and Williams is a legitimate top five defensive tackle in the NFL. He has four and a half sacks this year, which out of the, the out of the defensive tackle spot is a lot. Their backup defensive tackle, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, Fola Rosano Fusaki. If you if I, I pronounce that wrong, so if someone could tell me how to pronounce that in the uh, at me on Twitter or put in the YouTube mentions. I'd appreciate that. But he's number one in one stop run stop win rate in the NFL right now. If you're into that kind of thing. And you said, I mean, Sheldon Rankin knows what he's doing. He's a vet and you know, CJ Mosley probably isn't the most modern NFL linebacker that exists at this point. But remember that 2019 game, he probably paid the best half of football in his life and almost he was the best player in the field that half yeah and almost single-handedly won the game and then got hurt for the rest of the year and i don't know what role how big of a role he can have in this game but once again you talk about just mismatching weaknesses with strengths and you know this is the we talked about this is the bills team that cannot run the football at all so you know, if the bill, if they come out and they still are trying to establish just goddamn run, you know, with Williams and Rankins and, and the other guy that I mentioned, I'm not going to say his name again. And Mosley, who's, who's a proven veteran and, and knows football and knows how to fill run lanes. 
you know, it will be really hard to get the run game going. Now with my track record, they're going to go out for like 300 yards rushing. But just on paper, it looks like it'll be a tough place to to get that going. Now, when I look at this game, like you said, probably their best outside of Quinton Williams, the best player was Marcus May. And I've loved Marcus May for a while. I think he's a really good player. But I think this is a really good game. And I had my notes talk about earlier. But I would really like to see them just force feed Stefan Diggs this game. Yep. You know, he yep. he's still playing good football. Like he's not too I think he's about 80 yards off where he was at this point last year. And I think like you have to diversify. You have to throw to Sanders. No, let let's take this game. Let's throw the ball to Stefan Diggs 12 times. Let's get him 150 yards and reward him for everything that he is on this team and, and get that part of the offense going, get him in rhythm. Cause I think this offense is really its best version of himself when it gets, goes through Stefan Diggs. And you look at a team with a depleted secondary like this. And I think this is a really good opportunity. If this front seven can hold up, if sense of round comes back to really push the ball downfield and get Josh Allen feeling good again. I mean, look what happened when they threw the ball to Diggs in the second half of that Jags game. All of a sudden, the offense was working for a little bit. I, I get it that they got a lot of mouths to feed, you know, between Sanders and Beasley and the run running backs. And I feel like sometimes Josh Allen and Brian Dable forget that Stephon Diggs was the leading receiver in the NFL a season ago. In this game, I need to see him get targeted 10 to 15 times. You know, they, he needs to be the centerpiece of their game plan because the Jets defensively, their secondary is a little bit of a mess right now, especially with Marcus May out for the season. There's no one in that secondary that can match up with Diggs and make plays like he can. So this needs to be a huge day for Stefan Diggs because not only that, Ryan, Stefan Diggs is without a doubt, as far as the receivers go, the best after the catch. None of the receivers make the plays he does after the catch. And he needs to be a guy that I think needs to get fed the ball, force fed the ball all game long. I 100% agree with you. Yep. And, you know, I, I, I think that's what it comes down to. And, and this is not a question I had in the notes, but, you know, we talked about this in the Miami game. And I think we even talked about this going into the Jags game, but that I think this is a game where if you want to make the fan base feel good, and even I think after that Jag game, it would take a while to really build people's trust back. But this is a game where I think you really need to put the pedal to the metal. I don't think this can be like a, a Meadowlands game last year where you win 18-10 to 10 on just kicking field goals. I think the Bills need to go in this week and score 30. And, you know, it seems like they've gotten the message based on the comments. Once again, sometimes that means nothing. Sometimes it's code speak. But, you know, McDermott said it this week. He's not ignoring the stone in his shoe. So even if Brown doesn't come back, I, I think there'll be some significant changes along this offensive line and the way they do things. You know, I, I think Dable and this offense is smart enough to find something that works. Brian Dable is a good offensive coordinator. I don't care what anyone says about this game or what they thought happened in the Miami game. I, But I want to feel, you know, it, it's been a while <laughs> since I felt they, they went on a tear through the first four games our first five games. And then they've had three ugly games here. And I just want to have a game where the offense moves freely down the field. Hicks chunk plays again. And and th- once again, this is the game where style points is going to matter. And if I'm, if, I mean, if I'm Sean McDermott and they, and you can score 50, you put up 50 in this game. Cause I think that's what this offense needs is to just feel good again and, and put up points in a big way. Absolutely. And I think that kind of just segues right into it. Like, you know, Score predictions for this game, Ryan. You know, sitting here on Tuesday night, what what do you predict for this game on Sunday? I say 38-21. Once again, I don't think it's – I think it's a game that maybe they come down slow, come out slow and, and Twitter melts down for a second. But, again, I – yes, they lost to a really talent-deficient Jaguars team, but I really refuse to think lightning strikes twice here. I, I just – the Bills are too good of a roster. The Jets are too depleted of a roster. And Josh Allen is too good of a quarterback and, and too smart and competitive as a quarterback to let this happen again. This is a well-coached team. This is a disciplined team. And I think they go out and get the job done. I have 38-21, but I think there's a real possibility that that Dable is on fuck it mode and, and tries to put up 
90 points to, to get this team, these fans feeling good again. Yeah, I just, I agree with you. I think um, I said it on the podcast last week that McDermott, you know, is, is only had one loss against a rookie quarterback. And of course I say that and they lose to a rookie quarterback, although it was not Trevor Lawrence who won the Jaguars this game. And, and, and McDermott's track record against inexperienced young quarterbacks is still remains in my eyes, very high, very good. And I agree with you. I think he, whether it's Mike White, whether it's Josh Johnson, whether it's whoever the hell the Jets roll out there behind center, I think McDermott doesn't make them look good at all. And I think this offense does kind of wake up a little bit. I I, I, I know they were saying that the Titans loss was a wake-up call, but in reality, there are Josh Allen slip away from probably winning that game. You, this past week was a wake-up call. If, that, if this last week doesn't get them going, then nothing will. And I do think that Throughout McDermott's time, we've seen this team respond very strongly after really bad losses. So I think the Bills come out and, and play a dominant game. I've been winning 31 to 10 in a game that's just never close in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think I could say better. If if I will be if you if you are one of those people who want me to be concerned and you're one of those people who are concerned, if something goes wrong in this game, I promise you I'll come back to this podcast next week with with a lot different words i promise you but i think it was a fluke this team will be fine in the long run and this is still a super bowl caliber football team absolutely so that about does it here for the 585 report we appreciate you guys listening and your continued support follow the both of us on twitter at mitchell underscore broder at sports rock Two. follow the show account at 585 report and check out all the good work at BF on the website, on YouTube, on all your podcast listening uh, services, wherever you listen to yours, listen to everyone else's because it's, you know, everyone's working hard and we want to support the whole BF family here. So for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of